everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for this educational webinar. My name is Corey Deharsh. I'm with Advanta IRA, and today I have the pleasure of being joined by the trio that is building blocks for apartment investing, William Madison, Cedric Marlowe, and Daniel Umstead. So again, our topic today is gonna to be a multifamily real estate outlook for 2023, guided by these three gentlemen that are real estate professionals. Again, my name, Corey Deharsh. I've been with Advanta IRA uh, since 2016. I've served a number of years as a client account manager, processing day-to-day -day investment transactions for a roster of clients assigned to me. And actually in 2020, I switched over to join Advanta's business development team, where I currently provide this type of educational content network within my local region and try to build people's understanding, knowledge, and awareness of the power of these self-directed retirement accounts. My first guest today is William Madison. I'll go ahead and explain William's bio. Uh, he has 25 year background in construction that includes over 10 years of experience in multifamily and commercial property management. He has worked as a service manager for multifamily complexes up to 490 units and during that time, he earned the OSHA 30 certification for site safety and a diploma in HVAC. A few years ago, he became a licensed realtor and learned how to underwrite multifamily deals, how to verify if it's an emerging market. And with his background, he can quickly evaluate what the property will need to reposition it to achieve market rents and raise the property's value. All of William's contact information is here on the screen. And if you are watching this webinar, you can find the recording, which will be posted onto our YouTube channel. So if you don't get to write this down quickly enough, you can always watch this back and pause it so that you can reach out to any of my guests today. My next two guests, as I just mentioned, are Cedric Marlowe and Daniel Umstead. As far as Cedric, he is a veteran of the US Navy where he served eight years active duty and nine years reserves. Cedric received an MBA in finance from LaSalle University. In 2009, Cedric began working for the Department of Defense as a contracting specialist and then as a contracting officer. In 2015, his first forte into real estate was as a wholesale of single family homes. In 2017, he purchased his first investment property, then flipped that property for a 22% return on investment. Following that, Cedric began to acquire rental properties in the Philadelphia market where he has amassed a nice rental portfolio. Now, Cedric primarily focuses on purchasing and managing commercial multifamily communities in emerging markets across the US. Cedric's goal is to positively touch as many lives as humanly possible through loving, caring, and sharing all that life has to offer. Cedric's contact information is here on the screen as well. And with Daniel, whose contact information is also on the screen, along with his photo there, Daniel is the founder of the Robert Nathaniel Group, which operates the RNG radio show. The radio show goes over topics such as credit repair, real estate, resume writing, and motivational tips for success. On the show, he invites guests such as business owners, entrepreneurs, and executives to discuss the true meaning of success along with their services. He has conducted over 200 interviews since May of 2020, covering bakers, authors, fitness instructors, credit repair specialists, lawyers, real estate investors, and yes, even a CMOS expert. His motivational words and advice have been inspired by many social media influencers such as Damon John, Michael Blanc, and Dan Locke. His first passion came in 2007 where he loved, where his love for helping others began with writing resumes. His work includes over 1,000 revised and edited resumes in his professional career. He is responsible for employing thousands of various industries. Daniel currently runs and operates the Robert Nathaniel Group as the owner, licensed realtor in the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area, resume writer, and motivational speaker. Uh, gentlemen, if I missed anything, please feel free to add it now. And again, thank you all so much for uh, working with me and scheduling this webinar to provide some education to our audience. Thank you. That was Corey. awesome. Corey. Thank you. You are very really welcome. Appreciate it. So for the audience today, our agenda is 
going to start with covering who Advanta is and what we offer and, and why we are related to this multifamily real estate investment space. Uh, basically, I'll give you a brief outline of what type of accounts you can have, how easy they are to set them up, and how quickly and easily you can invest into multifamily real estate. And then I'm going to turn over to these gentlemen to cover their multifamily outlook for 2023. And after they've finished their presentation, we're going to go over your questions and answers in a full conclusion at the end. So if you are an attendee today live, just know that you will be muted for the duration of the presentation. However, there is a question box in your GoToWebinar panel that you can type up any questions you have for the presentation. And again, we'll hold those to the end, but I will get through and try to read as many as I can, respect to everyone's time, so that these gentlemen can answer your questions. All right, jumping right into things. Advanta IRA is a self-directed retirement custodian. We've been in business and in this industry for 20 years now. This is our 20th year in business. We've got about 10,000 active clients right now and just over 2 billion in assets under management. All of our clients' funds that are not actively invested are insured up to FDIC limits. And one other thing, aside from these free educational components that we put out, that we try to do to stand above and beyond others in our industry is that we pair each client with a concierge style white glove customer service account manager that's going to help you with all of your questions and assist you with your transactions so that everything is done as efficiently as possible all the t's are dotted and the i's are crossed and you're basically just telling us what you want to invest into and we help you facilitate it from there it's very important I disclose that we do not provide any tax, legal, or financial advice at Advanta IRA. We're experts in what the IRS does and does not allow with your retirement account. Many of our staff has a CISP designation or certified IRA service professional. But again, we are not attorneys, we're not financial advisors or tax advisors. So we always implore you to consult your own professionals and work with your own team as you're putting together an investment strategy and your investment forecast. If you have not heard about self-directed retirement investing, that's okay, and it's really common too. Only about 4% of US-based retirement accounts are currently self-directed. And to put that into perspective, the total value of US-based retirement accounts is hovering somewhere around 38 to 39 trillion, with a T, trillion dollars uh, as of right now. So again, only about 4% of that is being self-directed. So a lot of what we do at Advanta IRA is trying to educate and expand the knowledge that this even exists so that people can decide if it's a good fit for them or not, and then take the power of their retirement dollars into their own hands, as opposed to having a financial advisor put you into stocks, bonds, or mutual funds that you may not necessarily trust or just not want to ride the wave of the fluctuation that's currently the market status right now. Many of different types of plans can be self-directed. I've got them all displayed here on this slide. Most of you are probably familiar with traditional and Roth IRAs, but if you're a small business owner with no W-2 wage earners or just a limited number of wage earners, we have small business plans like the Solo 401k, SEP and Simple IRAs that may fit your needs, and also health savings and education savings accounts can be self-directed. So if you're someone with a high deductible health policy, or you've got a young one that you're raising or in your life that you love, that you'd like to set aside tax sheltered money for their education expenses, you can certainly do that. Feel free to reach out and I can provide you more information about those various plan types. And I'll also speak with you about what you think needs uh, fits your needs and what would actually work for your specific scenario and goals. Now, why do people choose to self-direct is a common question we get at Advanta. There are a few simple reasons that kind of make up the whole self-directed industry. First, the tax benefit that comes with a self-directed account. If you're already making these types of investments and then learn you can do it with your tax sheltered money, that's a key component for people switching over to start self-directing. So any traditional or tax deferred account means that your investments grow and you do not pay taxes on the earnings until later in life when you make a distribution out of your retirement account to cover your retired expenses. If you have a tax free or a Roth account, all of the earnings you make in that account are completely tax free because you've already paid the taxes on the money when you put it into that Roth or tax free account. 
A lot of people, as I mentioned a few slides ago, are getting fatigued with the stock market. They're not trusting the fluctuation of those stock bond and mutual fund assets that a lot of your fiduciary custodians would place you into. So that's a reason some people switch to self-direction. And then finding it as a new source of capital. If you're already doing these types of alternative investments, and then you learn that you can do these investments with your tax sheltered money, that's a key component for people that are in the real estate industry to switch over to self-direction. Or even if you're in the real estate industry and you're a capital raiser, having the power of explaining this to people you're capital raising to could allow you to draw more dollars from that investor because they have their personal money that they wanna invest with you and potentially their retirement account funds as well. Now, why are these a good source of capital? It's very easy to make repeat investments. If you find a syndicator or a specific investment partner that you deploy funds with and the investment pans out well and you wanna reallocate those funds, it's very simple and easy to do so. No outside approval is needed. With a self-directed account, you are your own fiduciary. Again, Advanta helps follow the IRS rules and make sure you do not run afoul of what the IRS allows or how they allow you to structure these investments, but you ultimately make the financial guidance and financial decisions for your retirement account. So no one is overseeing your investments from a yes, you should or no, you shouldn't standpoint besides yourself. You could typically draw better returns from these accounts than your standard money market or CD type accounts. And again, with a retirement fund, you're usually not touching this money anyway until you reach retirement age. So the money that you've already got sitting aside, if you can put it into a real estate deal and draw better returns than the fluctuation or what you expect on a stock bond or mutual fund, why not place that money that you're otherwise gonna have sitting until you retire anyway? It's very simple to move your funds from an existing IRA account or a previous employer 401k account and start self-directing it. This process all in all from turning in an application to having your account funded and making your first investment typically takes about two weeks speaking conservatively. And it is usually a non-taxable and sometimes a non-reportable event to get your money moved over. There are two key ways to move money. First is a custodian to custodian transfer, which is moving money from the same type of account at a previous company to a new account with a self-directed custodian. So picture a Roth IRA to a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA to a traditional IRA. You fill out one simple form with the receiving party, they submit it to the sending party and we facilitate that. Again, it's typically done pretty quickly. The other option, if you have a previous employer plan, whether that's a 401k, a 403b, a 457, or a thrift savings plan, if you've left that employer, you can easily roll that money into a self-directed account without any tax consequence. There is some tax reporting, but as long as the amount you pull out of the account is the same amount you roll into the new account, there's no tax liability to be had for you. It's very important to invest within your network. Again, because you're serving as your own fiduciary and your own financial guider, make sure you understand who you're investing with, you've done your due diligence, and you're comfortable and confident in the partnerships that you put together as you decide to make your self-directed investments. So just as a brief description of how to invest into multifamily with your retirement funds, I've just got three quick examples here. A lot of people are familiar with syndication investments, so you can use your retirement account as a limited partner in a syndication deal. The real only stipulations there are if you're a general partner in the deal or making day-to-day -day decisions for that syndication, you probably shouldn't invest your retirement account as a limited partner. Uh, but aside from that, uh, you pretty much can invest into any partnership that you want as a limited partner uh, where you would otherwise just use your self-directed retirement account alongside your personal money, or you may have already been using personal money in syndications. Now that you know you can self-direct your retirement funds into those, maybe that's more investment power that you have now. You can definitely do private lending. So as, not, as long as you're not lending to a disqualified person, you can basically lend at your own terms that you negotiate with the borrower any funds from your retirement account as an investment transaction. And then the third option here for multifamily case is doing a joint venture. So maybe you have the money in your account to buy a multifamily unit 
and you want to partner with someone that knows how to rehab and do some of the legwork that you can't do as a retirement account investor. So you set up a joint venture agreement that stipulates any terms that you agree to. Uh, for a brief example, my retirement account is going to buy the property. I have a joint venture agreement with William, who is a construction contractor and is going to renovate the property. And once that's done, we're going to sell the property and split the proceeds of the sale at a designated percentage. That would be a joint venture agreement. Again, as the account holder, you set those terms and handle that however you see fit. And that is the way that those can be structured. There's certainly other ways to structure multifamily investing. If you've got an idea or want to speak about that further, please feel free to reach out and I'll be happy to discuss your scenario on a complimentary consultation. Real quick, Advanta offers a lot of free education. You can check out our events on our website to see our upcoming webinars. You can check out our video catalog of this webinar and other webinars we've put out in the past on YouTube, Advanta IRA's YouTube page. And also, if you're interested in the industry standard news for retirement investing, we have a blog you can find on our website as well if you're interested in that type of content. It's very quick to sign up with Advanta. Uh, we have a very simple application process. It takes most people 15 minutes or so to complete it. So feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to help you whenever you're ready. And with that being said, I'm going to turn over to Building Blocks for Apartment Investing, William, Cedric, and Daniel. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for the introduction there, Corey. All right, um, we can go to slide two for a little bit of house cleaning. Uh, we are not an accountant, lawyer, or your financial advisor, so we cannot advise you on those matters. You should always seek the competent legal and financial advice from a professional that you trust. What we will review is for informational purposes only and cannot replace the services of a licensed professional. This is just valuable information to spark conversation that may benefit you. Also, as you think of any questions, if we run out of time, please go to our website, bb4ai.com. That's bbforai.com and we will contact you with the answer to your questions. Next slide. Keeping up with the economy has been quite a roller coaster these last few years. In 2020 and 2021, we saw supply chain problems, 0% interest rates, and just about everyone received a stimulus check. While the stimulus checks and the low interest rate helped to support the economy through that rough period, it was those moves that led us to the inflation that we see today. Next. With the massive spending and supply chain issues, businesses quickly raised their prices on everything across the board. In order to bring down inflation, the Federal Reserve has aggressively raised their interest rates. That move created a strain on businesses, which caused them to close, and that starts the cycle of unemployment. Next. All right, next, uh, next please. What is cyclical unemployment? Cyclical unemployment is the component of overall unemployment that results directly from cycles of economic upturn and downturn. Unemployment typically rises during recessions and declines during economic expansions. Why is this? Well, one reason unemployment rises is because banks lending criteria gets tighter. And if banks aren't lending, business owners can't float accounts receivable nor accounts payable. So the inverse applies during this expansion. Speaking of banks, William, can you tell us about some of the recent banking troubles? Uh, yes, banks are closing and the FDIC only insures depositors up to 250,000. Next slide. The spark was lit by the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. The bank couldn't pay the depositors because their money was tied up in long-term bonds, and bonds are sensitive to interest rate hikes, which the feds had been having a party with. They just increased the interest rate another 25 basis points at their last meeting. The stock market has started a downward slide, and there are experts in the field that are saying that it could decrease by 30% or more. Next slide. Okay, um, the Federal Reserve uh, Bank, they're basically saying the U.S. banking system is sound and resilient. Uh, recent developments 
are likely to result in tighter credit conditions for households and businesses and to weigh on economic activity, such as hiring and inflation. The extent of these effects is uncertain. However, the committee remains highly attentive to inflation risks. Now, why did they uh, make this statement? Because of the recent events in the banking sector, the Fed had to make, uh, make that statement to ease the nerves of the United States citizens. Uh, our current unemployment rate is 3.6% as of February and total unemployed people was 5.9. What's not in these numbers are the underemployed and those individuals who have given up on finding a decent living wage. Uh, the lowest historic unemployment rate is 3.4%. So you see, we're only two tenths off of the lowest historic rate. And I just spoke about cyclical uh, unemployment. Now let's talk about consumer price index. It is the measure of the average change over time in the prices paid for urban consumers for a market basket of consumer goods and services. So this is basically what captures the inflation rate, the change in prices over a period of time. Even though we know inflation is continu continuing to climb and we are having issues in the banking system, William, what are some of the major brokerages saying about multifamily? Yes. Uh, now, the market outlook report from Marcus and Millchat and CBRE, they agree that the U.S. multifamily sector is expected to perform above average in 2023 despite economic headwinds and ongoing capital market disruptions. The national affordability gap, which is the difference between the monthly payment on a median price house and the average apartment rent, doubled last year as decade high, high mortgage rates compounded elevated single family home prices. Once economic headwinds abate, these, bar these barriers to home ownership will direct more residents to apartments and encourage tenants to rent longer into their lives. Strong housing fundamentals should keep occupancy rates above 95% and drive 4% growth. Dan, can you elaborate on a couple of the cities that are performing above average? Yes, uh, next slide. So uh, today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be actually going over about five cities. Uh, the first three, though, or I should say the first one I want to target is Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, major employers in Huntsville include defense contractors such as Boeing and Lockheed Martin, as well as healthcare providers such as Crestwood Medical Center and Huntsville Hospital. Um, as you can read on the slide, I put down active renters, but later on I'll actually be going over my word of the day, lifestyle renters. Um, as mentioned with the employers, the job market itself in Huntsville has also seen an increase of 3.5%. And the reason for this is new construction is being put into place, as you can see, which is all set to happen uh, later on this year. Uh, next slide. My next city, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, when you're looking, you know, as far as multifamily investing, uh, the first place you should really focus on outside of these cities is your own backyard. But after doing so and finding other places to invest in, really look at the uh, job market and growth. And that's really what I'm going to be targeting with all of these cities. In Tulsa, the metro's diverse economy is benefiting from the presence of many energy, aerospace, and technology companies, such as St. Francis Health System, Helmrich & Payne, which is the U.S. leading unconventional driller, Bach Financial, and their annual revenue alone for 2022 was a little over $2 billion. And outside of being the second largest city in Oklahoma, in 2022, they saw an influx of 7,000 residents. Now, remember I mentioned employment and jobs, so hear this if you will. On top of the employers I just mentioned, Amazon had its third fulfillment center open in the area. And Canoe, it's like, well, 
who's that? Uh, who they are, they're pretty much working on the next Tesla as their focus is on electrical vehicles. And they're building a new plant, uh, which is set to break ground in 2023. Some additional numbers, home listing prices have increased 10.9% year over year, averaging, get this, 227,000, which if you're looking to start a family or those that are looking to start a family, this looks like a good place to uh, lay your head at. Uh, next slide. Now I talked about uh, Active Renter. My word of the day is Lifestyle Renter. Who are they, you may be asking? Lifestyle renters are those folks who don't want to deal with the maintenance and upkeep of a home, nor do they want to have to deal with the savings for a down payment, but would rather find that mid to high end amenity rich rental property to stay in for quite some time. On average, uh, this could range from three to five years, depending upon their personal goals that they have going on, whether it be family, career, lifestyle, or even school. Uh, said, can you actually uh, incorporate more as to why why lifestyle renters are becoming more common? Yes, absolutely. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so apartments are facing five headwinds and benefiting from three tailwinds this year. This is based off of globestreet.com. So first I'll go over headwinds. First is labor market challenges. No matter where you go, in this country, there's hiring now signs in every window and most billboards. In addition, the salaries that most working class citizens are making is not enough to keep up with the rise in consumer prices. Inflation and interest rates. The current inflation rate is about 6.04%. Again, as inflation rate continues to rise, consumers will have to make decisions on what they can and cannot afford in the housing sector. Supply and demand. Well, it is said that between 4.6, 4 to 6 million units need to be built by 2034 to house those who will need places to live. With the rising cost of materials and instability in the economy, fewer units are being built. Now, a uh, regulatory environment. Well, local government may not want multifamily being built to the lack of uh, infrastructure in their community or don't want a population explosion. Lastly, a uh, possible recession. Well, that pretty much speaks for itself. Uh, next slide, please. But all is not bad. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in this business. Now let's talk tailwinds. Demographics, right? Well, Gen Zers is predicted to soon be the largest generation, soon outpacing that of baby boomers. Uh, the oldest of this generation are now entering the post-education years. Well, with the influx of immigrants, most of who first entered this country, their first housing choice is apartments. Technology and innovation. Well, this goes back to Daniel's lifestyle renters point, right? Because of COVID, virtual tours of apartments have become the norm. So even if you are leaving from one area and moving to another, oftentimes you've already selected an apartment because of these tours. As people are working virtually, many now want Wi-Fi in their apartments, along with uh, a one-stop shop in their community, like full service gyms, uh, convenience stores, clubhouses, and other amenities, and sustainability considerations. Many apartment communities now provide green space for their residents and also uh, electrical hookups for their electric vehicle. So what's ahead, right? Pay close attention to the labor markets. Are people going back to work? And will the $15 minimum wage go nationwide? Also pay attention to inflation trends. Will inflation and interest rates continue to rise? And will we see a correction in the market or will it be a full blown recession? 
pay attention to technology and services. How is AI going to change our world? And of course, we must address supply and demand imbalance. Will there be enough units to house everyone who needs a place to stay? Uh, Daniel, what other top cities should we pay attention to in 2023? Thank you, Sid. Yeah, so I spent some time on the uh, Western Front, you know, going over Tulsa, Oklahoma, as well as uh, Huntsville, Alabama, um, which, you know, is definitely on the East Coast. Uh, the other one um, that I want to point out was uh, New York. And I'm not talking about the city, uh, but don't get me wrong, there have been some major deals going on in the F5 boroughs, but dollar volume in the second half of last year fell by 12% and transaction volume dropped by 23% from the first half as the cost of debt doubled in just one year, according to an article from Pat Ralph on The Real Deal. So with that being said, White Plains, New York, with only being less than an hour away, now that's driving from New York City, White Plains saw an incredible market jump. The number of homes for sale in White Plains, New York, increased by 2.4% between January 2023 and February 2023. Now, while the average time on the market in February 2023 was 60 days, the median list price, get this, $537,000. That's why I said Tulsa, Oklahoma, average sales price uh, was around 227. So that's why I said it's a good place to start. Now, um, I pointed out uh, Amy Rose from Rose Associates. Uh, she landed a $182 million loan for a White Plains multifamily project uh, based on an article from 2021. So I decided to do some digging, you know, see where she's currently at with her company. And recently in mid-2022, she talked about further how the suburbs surrounding the city are continuing to scale, not only in White Plains uh, being a hot market, but surrounding areas as well. Uh, next slide. The next one on my list is uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, an article written by Jeff Hammond from Janover Multifamily Loans pointed out that sales prices shot up between 40% uh, between uh, 2021 and 2022 per unit basis. Now, in comparison to Nashville, which is uh, four times in Knoxville, uh, they had a huge housing shortage. And, you know, how is the city addressing it? New construction. Uh, new construction is looking to elevate during 2023. And with that, sales predictions for rental rates uh, will rise by 4.2%, according to CAR, which is a Knoxville Area Association for Realtors. Now, I had the opportunity personally from my last employer to visit Nashville, and in comparison to Philadelphia, I was used to more bustling streets, but man, when I hit that downtown area, OMG, and Knoxville is no exception. Despite being a two and a half hour drive away, Knoxville ranked number 10 among the top U.S. metros for annual job growth in 2022, with total annual employment up 4.9%, from the previous year, according to an analysis by RealPage Inc. And another note, uh, CAR uh, mentioned for home prices that they're looking at between three to 5% in 2023. So it's not just rentals going up, but also home sales. Next slide, Viva Las Vegas. No, I'm kidding, excuse me, Reno, Nevada. Now Reno has seen some growth in the city's growing job market and population. Looking at a map, it's got some distance between Vegas and Reno, but California is right next door to its gem. Uh, population has seen an increase of 8.9% in the last decade. And I did some research for you guys. So I looked at a report done by Jordan Lehman for Colliers, and he pointed out that despite the rent growth not being as explosive, average rents were still up 12.1% year over year. And like I said, there's some distance between Vegas and Reno, good seven hours, but knowing that Vegas households are 47% renter occupied gives you a good sense as far as where Reno is headed. Now, Seth, I know that you are focusing more on market cycles. Can you elaborate further as far as why we're seeing this growth uh, post COVID? Absolutely. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, um, in real estate, there are market cycles and uh, Professor Mueller, uh, he captured this uh, many years ago back in the 90s. And um, basically, 
there are four market cycles in real estate. There is the recovery phase. There is the expansion phase. There's the hyper supply phase. And of course, unfortunately, the recession phase. Well, recovery phase, in this phase, you'll see um, occupancy in the trough and there's gonna be higher vacancy. Well, in this phase, we are just coming out of the recessionary phase, hence the name recovery. Uh, expansion phase two, rents begin to rise. There's a tight supply of rental units and demand growth is still ahead of supply. Well, in this phase, we are seeing the growth of the macro economy where wages are up, interest, interest rates are, uh, are lower and, um, and uh, you know, so now there's a need for more housing units, uh, hyper supply phase. In this phase, supply growth is higher and demand uh, is higher than demand growth. So at this point, we've seen more units come online and now there's an oversupply of units. This is where we began to offer concessions in the multifamily space. Or if you're talking real estate in the single family space, uh, this becomes a buyer's market. Um, recession phase. This cycle, uh, the cycle is determined by the difference between the market supply growth and demand growth. Well, in this phase, the US economy is in a recession um, and understand that uh, in real estate, uh, the real estate market usually trails the economy by at least six months and um, demand is low. So building new units uh, slows to a snail's pace. So you may ask Cedric, where are we in this real estate market cycle currently? Well, we're at the peak. And if you look there on the chart, it's number 11, uh, the peak or equilibrium point uh, where we all, where we are still seeing demand being higher than supply in the marketplace. However, we are certainly trending into the hyper supply phase. Uh, so William, why is now a good time to invest in multifamily? William? I think we may have uh, lost William. Okay. Well, right now, why is a good time to invest in multifamily, you ask? Uh, again, oh. it says it right there on the screen. Homes are becoming unaffordable. Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, William, William you're back. back. <laughs> I do apologize about that, gentlemen. Technical issues, technical issues. Uh, right now, it is a golden opportunity to invest in multifamily properties because there's a lot of people that's getting priced out of the single family home market. They're unable to buy property because the cost has gone up so extremely and they'll still need a place to live, you know, perhaps in your multifamily complex. As the year goes on, we will see cap rates decompressing and price points will start coming down. You'll wanna position yourself to be able to capitalize on that opportunity by making connections with brokers, lenders, and other investors. Also by learning more about investing in multifamily properties. Next slide, please. Now is the perfect time to join Building Blocks for Apartment Investing. We have a monthly meetup group where you can learn more about multifamily investing from Cedric, Daniel, and I, as we bring other professionals to share their expertise and experience to assist you in your investing career. If you're unable to make the meeting, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll find more information there. Daniel and Cedric, can you share your final thoughts with the audience? Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, actually, while uh, Will was having some technical issues, I got a chance to uh, Google uh, something really important. Um, a new study commissioned by the National Multifamily Housing Council and National Apartment Association reveals the U.S. needs to build 4.3 million new. This is not renovated. This is not rehab, but brand new apartments by 2035 to address demand deficit and affordability. So uh, 
I gave out the top five cities, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Huntsville, Alabama, Knoxville, Tennessee, White Plains, New York, and Reno, Nevada as pretty much a guidance, but really start in your own backyard, uh, get connected with us, you know, to help you out with those next steps. Um, but really the market is hot despite what's going on in the news and what you're hearing. Uh, Seth, you got anything uh, further to share? Yes. So uh, we want you to pay attention to the unemployment rate on a weekly basis. Well, uh, the federal government puts this out every Friday. Um, again, as I said earlier, unemployment rises during recessions and falls during expansions. So if week after week you begin to see an increase in unemployment rate, be cautious because that would mean banks are tightening their lending criteria. I know most of us don't watch the news because it's always doom and gloom, uh, but it does keep us informed. So pay attention to the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, and listen to see what consumer goods are continuing to increase in price. This will continue uh, to provide clues to where the US economy is heading. Most economists expect the Fed to increase the uh, Fed funds rate um, another two, uh, 25 basis points at least two more times this calendar year. Uh, this is to slow the spending of the consumer market, which ultimately they hope will bring down inflation. Uh, well, the S&P 500 lost 19.4% over the last 12 months. NASDAQ is down 15.57% over the last 12 months. And the Dow Jones is down 7.13% over the past 12 months. So what does this mean for you? Be very selective with your investing dollars. Find assets which are recession resistant, like real estate, to invest passively in. Of course, as a multifamily operator, I am partial to multifamily. So partner with experienced operators and teams like us here at Building Blocks for Apartment Investing. William, do you have any uh, final comments? Actually, I would just like to thank Corey for having us present today to everyone. And I would like to thank everyone for attending this presentation. And I look forward to seeing you at our next meeting. Corey? All right, gentlemen. Well, thank you very much. I think this has been an extremely informative uh, outline or outlook for our audience into the multifamily space. I do see a question or two here in the question box. And I just want to reiterate, if you would like to ask a question in front of uh, the audience or on this recorded session, uh, please feel free to add that into the questions option in your GoToWebinar panel. Otherwise, as displayed on the screen right now, you could reach out directly to Building Blocks for Apartment Investing and field questions there. Uh, I implore you to check out their, their call. I was a guest speaker back in January for them, and uh, it's a really great resource to both uh, find other investors and network further, as well as just generally learn about different aspects of investing that you may not already know or just may not be well familiar with. It's very collaborative, very welcoming, so please check that out if that is of interest to you. Uh, gentlemen, uh, here's one question I have here uh, from one of the participants today. If we are short 4.6 million units, why are we at the peak of the market cycle where the next phase is hyper supply? Okay. Well, one reason is because it's you have to look at, again, the macro economy. Okay. You're at the macro economy. Remember, so remember in expansion phase, uh, that's where rents begin to rise and uh, there's a tight supply of rental units and there's that demand growth, which is ahead of supply. Now, the hyper supply um, is basically where uh, the supply growth is higher than the demand. But what happens is as the, uh, uh, we basically come into a recession, 
people have to depend on, decide on where they want to spend their dollars, okay? And also remember, banks tighten in the hyper supply phase. Banks are tightening their lending criteria. And so then, because they're uh, tightening borrowers or builders, if you will, won't have access to funds or it'd be even uh, strict, uh, more strict in order for them to uh, be able to buy or, or lend, I'm sorry, get mortgages for their uh, apartment buildings. All right, well, thank you very much for that response. Uh, here's another question I see coming in. Um, and, and gentlemen, if, if any of these questions are too direct and you'd like to answer them, uh, you know, one-to-one -one offline off the recorded session, uh, please feel free to address that. Obviously, there, there's no, um, you know, pressure on you to, to answer anything on this recorded call that would otherwise be, you know, a one-to-one -one conversation to be had. Um, this one reads off, how does your team plan to navigate the current environment in multifamily investing where supply is increasing, softening rent rates, high cap rates, and a high interest rate environment thus putting downward pressure on prices. Okay, um, I'll speak to that again. Well, one with uh, careful underwriting, you know, being very, very cautious in our underwriting and um, also uh, getting with the right teams, continuing to network and, uh, you know, getting with the right teams, other uh, experienced investors, and um, us forming collaborative to be able to take down a lot of these um, assets. And um, so, you know, that's pretty much what we're trying to do. And of course, uh, with the cap rates starting to rise, uh, you know, right now, I'm currently looking for uh, assumable loans. That's another way that I'm going about it, uh, being able to purchase some of the assumable loans that's out there because of. Uh, you know, 2020, 2021, a lot of people were having, um, you know, got bridge loans. So now those bridge loans are coming due. And majority of the uh, in owners out there can't refi out like they had uh, anticipated when they uh, took out these bridge loans. So now looking to find assumable loans uh, to be able to basically take down. And again, like I said, be very conservative in your underwriting, uh, you know, basically year one, year one, you know, you should probably put uh, no increase, no increase at all for rent rates. Uh, so those are just some of the things that we're doing. And, and another thing is also, uh, you know, a lot of things we look for value add uh, apartments, right? I like to invest in B and C class. Well, during this time, you look for look for more B class assets because they're they will probably not get hit as hard um, once the recession is fully, in, you know, in effect. Because those people who are pretty much in B class apartments are, you know, a lot of them are white collar um, uh, business professionals that may not want to pay that top dollar that you will find in an A-class apartment. So they may step down to a B-class apartment. So that's the other thing, looking for B-class assets that uh, still have uh, meat on the bone and those sellers are ready to uh, sell and move on to bigger and better things. Also, uh, just to add into what uh, Cedric was just saying, there may be other owner operators out there that just need an influx of cash in order to complete their projects. So perhaps we may be able to partner with them so that that way, being as though they already have the infrastructure in place, you know, we will be able to join in so that, that way we can make that particular project successful. Perfect. Well, uh, Cedric, William, thank you for those answers and, and that feedback. I've got one question directed to my attention and two more for you guys. Um, we still have a few moments left, so if anyone wants to get their questions in, please feel free to add those uh, here as soon as possible. We do try to be respectful to everyone's time, so I've got about seven, eight minutes before I'll probably um, call the, the webinar today uh, and close it. 
but just real quick, someone asked, how can we invest in multifamily at Advanta without going over the FDIC limit? Do we open multiple accounts? So just to clarify that there, the FDIC limit side of things is only relevant to the uninvested funds you have in your Advanta IRA account. So in this case, making a multifamily investment does not go against the total FDIC limit, which as the gentleman referenced today, I believe is $250,000 on deposits. Uh, furthermore, Advanta holds those funds in trust bank accounts, uh, basically in the name of your retirement account. So any undirected funds, if you were a client with us, you'd be able to see on your profile as undirected funds, uh, that would be the amount subject to the FDIC limit. Monies that you actually have actively invested in multifamily do not count against that total because it's an active investment on your profile, an asset held by your retirement account. I hope that clarified for that individual. And if not, or if you have further questions, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Next question for you, gentlemen. I am told rent slash lease prices are dropping. What percent are prices dropping since home prices are dropping? I think that's probably a generalization because that's also going to be regionally based, uh, you know, and in, in the specific area that you're looking at investing into. But nonetheless, that was the question posed. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I can address that real quick. I mean, I already gave the comparison with Tulsa, Oklahoma. You're talking, you're talking about average home prices out there being around two twenty-five to two fifty. Meanwhile, White Plains, New York, uh, you're looking at a half a million dollar from home. So it's really going to be dependent upon the area. And I would highly recommend we, you know, aren't trying to give out any, you know, personal financial advice. We would definitely recommend doing your own research first, you know. And if there's further clarification on that you're looking for, once you do have that set information. Definitely, by all means, go to our website, fill out the contact info, and uh, get in contact with us. Uh, said I cut you off. What were you going to add? No, I have nothing else. That that was great. <laughs> all right. And Dan, uh, actually mentioning going to the contact us section on your website leads right into the next question pretty well. Uh, the next person said, how does someone invest in multifamily with you so is that the best way to learn about what deals you guys may have on the table obviously this is an educational component webinar today so i, I can't really um let you guys go into any specific deals but if you have something available or someone wants to invest with you how would they get a hold of you and and learn more and have that conversation with your team yeah by all means i think the beginning part you know uh you did a fabulous fabulous introduction of all three of us so our contact information is on there uh, I just want folks to be aware SEC requires that conversation to be done beforehand before any type of discussion. Uh, myself and William Madison both being realtors, um, even when it comes down to that, we need to disclose that we are uh, realtors and what the business would be. So to get that conversation going, either you know go back to the beginning, uh, shoot us a text, or uh, better yet, you know, go through our website, bb4ai.com, and then fill out the contact form. And then either uh, either three of us will be in contact with you, and then we could set up a call and then go forward from there. And this is going from somebody who's entry level, that's sourcing deals, all the way to somebody who's got a couple of deals under the plate. Um, we got our superstar, uh, said Marlowe, you know, leading the way with over 180, uh, you know, uh, plus units that he's been involved with and currently. So uh, we definitely got some experts on the team from beginning to end. Perfect. Well, thank you for outlining that uh, again and further. Uh, as I had mentioned and, and Dan just referenced, you can go back to the slide deck if you're watching this and participating live. You'll receive a copy of this presentation uh, within about a day via email. You can go to Advanta's YouTube page and this will be posted within about 24 hours of this live recording here on March 30th, 2023. Um, also, uh, I am happy to share my portion of the slide deck if anyone wants to reach out for it. Uh, gentlemen, if that's something that you guys are okay with, with, uh, people can email myself or, or yourselves uh, for the slide deck if that's something you guys are willing to share as well. Absolutely. Yes, that would be Absolutely. Awesome. awesome. Okay. Uh, last two questions before we wrap up. Again, I'm trying to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, with mortgage rates high, how can there be a sustainable profit? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, we talked about this before, you know, when it comes to demand. I, I want folks to really just look at, you know, apartment buildings. If you're going by an apartment building, you're seeing a family of four, mom, dad, uh, maybe a teenager uh, or somebody who's like, you know, middle school age. It, it, the demand is going to be over time. So don't think that, you know, what you're hearing out there outside of, you know, the craziness um, going on. But when they're talking about the high demand in 2035, we're talking 12 years from now. So that 17 year old is going to be 29 in 12 years. At that point in time, they're either going to be established with either their career after college and going to need a place to stay. And, you know, the way that the employment is surging, especially with artificial intelligence, technology and healthcare expanding, um, they're going to be in decent jobs where they're becoming lifestyle renters. So instead of, you know, going through what we grew up on, uh, well, I'm just talking about my age, but what we grew up on as far as, you know, uh, getting a home, building a family. Now these uh, Gen Zers, as uh, said at point out, are saying to themselves, hmm, let me find a place that I can actually just stay in that's providing all my amenities and what I need to get my job done, especially um, like myself working in a work from home environment. Um, I hope that answers it. Uh, Will and said, do you have anything else to add? Well, um, yes, the, the answer is actually within the question. The fact that mortgage prices are starting to go up so high, homes are being priced so high, you know, people can't afford it at this point, you know, so they have to head to some place. They're going to have to live somewhere and that place is going to be apartment buildings. So if we invest within those within that sector, then there's guaranteed um, going to be a it's going to become profitable. It's going to become profitable for us. Perfect, wonderful. And the final uh, item from our audience that I'm going to address, it's actually not worded as a question, more so a statement. So I'll read off that statement. And uh, if any of you have input or feedback to provide, uh, I'll, I'll let you address that. And then we'll close out from there. Uh, so this last key piece from our audience, banks are squeezing tightly on new loans and interest rates are making it almost impossible to refinance what would be the avenue for new acquisitions for multifamily apartments in this market? So actually, I guess it is worded as a question. My apology, there's just no question mark at the end. Uh, what would be the avenue for new acquisitions in multifamily apartments, given that banks are squeezing tightly on new loans and interest rates are making it almost impossible to refi? Um, I, I will start out and then maybe William or Dan can uh, pitch in. Um, I would say right now, uh, you know, I would look for Freddie and Fannie right now, those type of loans uh, right now. Uh, Fannie, Fannie is about 5.5% uh, on their multifamily loans, and Freddie is running about 5.6% on their multifamily loans. So those are pretty much, or your local, your local banks. And I'm not talking about the TD banks and the uh, Wells Fargo's and the bigger banks, your local backyard banks uh, they tend to be and especially if you're going to be investing in that specific market they tend to have very great loan products and very great loan rates as well yeah to add on to that i mean we had an amazing guest speaker uh, back in february kevin greer um and that's his primary focus you know he's not coming from a big bank um he is that community local based bank and my nine to five because you know, uh, being an investor in multifamily, you know, still got to put uh, food on the table. But um, my current employer, you know, we are a community service bank. So as said, mentioned before, you know, don't be knocking on the doors, PNC Bank, Bank of America or Chase, really, you know, Google, what are the community banks near my area? And just talk to somebody, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a conversation it's just asking, hey, how do you work with folks doing multifamily investing What's your criteria? What are you looking for? So that way, when you are sourcing deals or looking for that next deal, you know what to bring to the table uh, to match up. Because outside of personal, you know, somebody that's, you know, looking to buy a home, they got to run through everything. They got to run through the credit. They got to look at pay history, your salary. Meanwhile, on the commercial side, as long as it's making money, according to their criteria, they're going to make it work. Uh, Will, anything to add? Yes, and yes. everyone has to keep in mind that banks are in the business to loan money. So as long as you're, as said said, as long as you're 
um, underwriting conservatively and the numbers work, then they will provide you that loan. And just to piggyback off of what Dan Daniel had said, um, I want to clarify, are we specifically referring to your small local community banks, or does that also kind of rope in uh, your local community credit unions as well, or do they handle these things slightly differently than, uh, you know, the difference between a bank and a credit union would handle the, these loans? No, the Let's start with the, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yeah, um, the credit unions as well. Yeah, they um, work primarily about the same as the banks. And I know uh, most a lot of investors, they prefer the credit unions because their uh, lending criteria is still basically about the same, but they're definitely in the business of uh, financing these type of assets. 1000% agreed. All right, gentlemen. Well, uh, again, I want to be respectful of your time. I want to be respectful of the audience's time. I think we've brought a lot of great education and information and your guys' uh, out, outlook on the 2023 multifamily market to the table. So thank you so much for working together and coordinating this with me. I really greatly appreciate having you guys on. I look forward to having you on again in the future. And again, to the audience, please feel free free to reach out to these gentlemen if you have any specific questions, want to learn how to invest with them, or want to join their community to learn more about this type of investments and see some of the guests they bring on for their own show. Uh, gentlemen, any final uh, closing words or parting words for the audience today? Again, I look forward to seeing y'all at our next meeting. And thank you. Thank you again, Corey, for having us. Thank you again, Corey. Thank you all for joining as well. All right. Well, we hope you have a great day and we hope to connect with you again in the near future. Thank you all and we'll see you next time.